Thanks, Greg. Uh, as Greg said, I'm Dennis Ahn, and I'm a gastroenterologist in Denver. Uh, and I have the opportunity uh, to talk about the family history and early onset colorectal cancer task group of the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable. Uh, some of you may not know uh, much about the roundtable. Many of you do. Uh, but the roundtable is really a national coalition of organizations. Over 130 organizations have come together. It was founded by the American Cancer Society and the uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention in 1997. Uh, the goal of uh, the uh, overall, one of the specific goals of the roundtable is to increase in the use of proven evidence-based colorectal cancer screening test among the entire population for whom screening is appropriate. You'll be familiar with, um, oh sorry, you'll be familiar with uh, the uh, project 80% by 2018 effort uh, that's morphed into the 80% in every community uh, ongoing effort to increase screening in the general population. The general strategy used by uh, the round table is to have strong leadership. Rich Wender is the chair. Uh, Bob Smith, who's here and going to give, I think, the next talk, uh, is the co-chair of the steering committee. Uh, Lisa Richardson is, uh, represents the CDC on the, that executive committee. Uh, and it doesn't work without uh, Kaleeb and Dion and, and Emily. And Kaleeb is here uh, as well, so you may run into him. Uh, the strategy that the, the group uses for uh, this is generally something like this. Uh, identify the groups. Holy mackerel. Uh, identify the groups uh, that are relevant, uh, identify the problems, and then get those groups to collaborate together. Uh, there's, the roundtable has a steering committee, uh, and uh, there are permanent members, and there are members that are uh, elected, uh, and there are task groups. Uh, and the family history and early onset colorectal cancer task group is one of these seven task groups. I should say uh, that before Rich was uh, chair of the round table, uh, Tom Weber, I think from around 2005 to 2012 was the chair, Bernard Levine, there's only been three chairs. Bernard Levine was before that. Uh, so this is really a strong and very consistent uh, group. Uh, the Family History and Early Onset Task uh, Group, uh, these are the leaders. Paul Schroy has been from the beginning uh, uh, co-chair of this task group. Recently, Steve Itzkowitz and Heather Hamill uh, have uh, joined as co-chairs of this. And so you might ask, why in the world am I here uh, to talk about this? Well, I was the chair uh, of uh, this task group with Paul uh, from, the, uh, from its founding. Uh, and. Um, and the real reason that I'm allowed to give this talk is because of this set of initials right here. Uh, a lot of the other initials that you see behind people doesn't mean anything. This one means something. This stands for friend of Tom Weber. <laughs> that's, that's the real reason I was asked to give this talk. Uh, and <laughs> And these are my conflicts of interest. Uh, so this task force was established in 2012. Uh, Paul and I established this uh, as a family history task force, or task group of the round table. It was expanded in early to, uh, late 2016 to include early onset colorectal cancer. Uh, and the charge of the group is to identify key issues and areas that are in need of familial inherited and early onset cancer uh, for the purpose of identifying opportunities uh, and being a catalyst uh, for change sort of a broad uh, scope. Uh, I'm going to present the activities of the Family History and Early Onset Group in the context of starting when we, in 2017, shortly after we added early onset colorectal cancer. And Tom was really instrumental in having the roundtable develop a summit and commit a summit to this specific topic. The summit focused on what we know, what we don't know, and what we need to know about early onset colorectal cancer. Uh, and as a result of that summit, uh, a paper that Jan Lowry took the lead in uh, writing, uh, a strategic plan was developed. And I'm going to sort of use this uh, as a way of telling you about some of the things that we did. At this conference, uh, I think the single thing that galvanized our group uh, to um, uh, together, the early onset portion of it and the family history portion of it, was this slide that Heather uh, Hample showed in an earlier, oh, I got too many things here, uh, showed in an earlier, uh, an earlier version of this slide was shown at that conference. Uh, and that was 
uh, data from Rachel Perlman and Heather's uh, group where they studied 450 patients with early onset colorectal cancer. All of them had cancer under the age of 50. They did genetic testing with a 25 gene panel for germline testing, and they obtained family history of colorectal cancer in the first degree relatives by, by self-report. 16% of this group had uh, carried a mutation in one of the hereditary cancer genes. An additional 14% of this group had a family history of colorectal cancer in the absence of a hereditary uh, syndrome. The question that was asked was, well, what about advanced adenomas? We know that the, all the guidelines in the United States suggest that uh, having a family history of an advanced adenoma carries about the same risk as having a family history of colorectal cancer. We don't know what this number is. Uh, I put about 14% here because I think that's an underestimate, in fact, because we know that the prevalence of advanced adenomas is about tenfold higher than the prevalence of colorectal cancer. Uh, but we don't actually have direct data here, but you'll hear an opportunity perhaps to get direct data. So this uh, is an estimate. Many of these patients uh, should have started screening earlier, should have started screening at 40 or earlier, depending upon the age of the cancer in their family, and they might have had their can colon cancers prevented uh, or detected earlier. Uh, so this really melded the interests of the family history group uh, with the early onset group uh, and, and established the fact that this is not the majority, probably, of cases, but this is an important contributor. So knowing the family history, just as Greg went through, is really an important component of doing something about early onset disease. So I'm gonna use that sort of uh, structure as a way to, uh, uh, to talk about what we're doing. These are the active projects. Uh, in, the, um, in uh, the family history early onset task group. Uh, the, conclusions of, um, the conclusions from this paper uh, were to accelerate new research, and they mentioned specifically causation and adenoma prevalence in the young, uh, to enhance adoption of evidence-based practices, and, and some of the things I'll talk about are using implementation scientists, promoting the ACS guidelines, and improving EHR collection in the family history, uh, and finally to solidify the commitment of the key partners in the, in the round table, and I'll focus on uh, that goal in the dissemination of the risk assessment and screening uh, toolkit. Uh, so, the uh, active projects, uh, uh, I'll start at the top with causation. Uh, this was not a project that was actually uh, initiated by, uh, by our task group, but it, many of our task group members were instrumental in developing this workshop. This was a Fight CRC workshop held in Denver in February, uh, and it focused just on causation. Uh, Heather Hampel is going to give a summary, a report back from this uh, workshop, so I won't talk any more about that. Uh, uh, but an important component of the recommendations from uh, Jan's paper. Uh, the, uh, we developed in 2017 a working group within our task group, an advanced adenoma working group. Christine Momente and Jordan Corlitz, who you've already heard from, uh, have, have chaired that. Uh, and uh, you'll hear about a couple of things uh, that have come out of that. Uh, Christine is gonna talk about the issue of advanced adenoma specifically, uh, and I think mentioned a bit about the advanced adenoma brief that the round table, that our task group uh, developed in, uh, for the round ta table. And in addition, this group uh, got some feasibility funding uh, to try to answer that question of what the uh, prevalence of advanced adenomas is in relatives of early onset colorectal cancer. What percentage of those folks uh, should have been screened earlier uh, than they were? Uh, and Heather's going to uh, talk about that. Um, and then uh, on-time screening. There's been a real interest in on-time screening in our task group. Uh, Whitney Jones has led this and been a real champion uh, for uh, starting screening on time. Uh, and the reason for that is because the screening rates are very low in the 50 to 54-year-old group, uh, shown here. So if you look at over time, from 2000 to 2015, uh, colon cancer screening rates have risen in all groups, but look at how the 50 to 54-year-old group lags behind. The 50 to 59, 55 to 59-year-old group is lower as well, but so there's this very strong age-related uh, relationship in co overall colon cancer screening. Less than 50% of individuals between 50 and 54 uh, are screened uh, properly for colorectal cancer. So here's a real need to identify 
uh, and increase screening rates and get screening started on time in the 50-year-old patients, or maybe now in the 45-year-old patients. There are other groups, uh, patients with a family history of colorectal cancer. Uh, the recommendation is to start screening at age 40 uh, or earlier, depending upon the age of the family members. Uh, and screening rates in the 40 to 49-year-old population with a family history of colon cancer are less than 40% really poor screening rates. If you did this for advanced adenomas, I don't know what it would be. Not maybe 10%. Uh, so real populations that need uh, an effort to increase on-time screening. And Whitney has done a great deal of work, and he'll talk about this in his presentation, about one of the issues is that you need to provide lead time uh, for individuals to make a decision, to understand that screening is important for them, to make a decision and actually start screening at the age in which you would like them to start screening. Uh, so you'll hear more about, more about that from Whitney. We're, we've written a paper uh, uh, together to uh, make this point uh, as well. Um, the ACS guidelines, we discussed the ACS guidelines in some detail in our, in our task group. They're, although the roundtable itself is uh, guideline neutral, our task group was far <laughs> from guideline neutral. Our task group, in fact, um, uh, said uh, that changing the screening in average risk population uh, from, four, from 50 to 45 is probably the single most important thing to do to try to decrease early onset colorectal cancer. It's less than half, but not much less than half of all the early onset colon cancer occurs in the 45 to 49 year old age group. Changing that on the basis of this rising incidence, and, and uh, Bob will tell you about uh, the development of these guidelines, we think this is a really important opportunity, perhaps the single most important opportunity right now to do something about early onset colon cancer. We'll talk, Robert will talk more about that. The two things that I'm going to talk about uh, are the um, a risk assessment toolkit uh, and update on the implementation, and I'm going to ask for your help in uh, the implementa implementation of this toolkit, uh, and then the completion, finally, of a Delphi survey that gets back to Greg's point about what, a, what needs to be in every high-quality electronic health record. So the toolkit. Uh, this is a risk assessment screening toolkit uh, to detect uh, and identify uh, family history and detect early onset colon cancer symptomatically. It was commissioned by the round table, I think paid for maybe by, in part by the American Cancer Society, conducted by the Jackson Laboratory with a lot of input from, the, from members of the round table and our task group uh, in the content. It was developed uh, to try to, it was, uh, to try to develop a system that could help primary care practices identify patients with that increased risk on the basis of either their personal history or family history, uh, to, to provide them with tools to apply screening guidelines based on risk, mechanisms for referring high-risk patients to genetics, and recognizing uh, the importance of early detection uh, and symptomatic detection in early onset disease. This is uh, sort of the, the organization of the toolkit, and it's present, it was presented here last year. Uh, so I'm not going to go into great detail, but there were four uh, steps, uh, creating a system to identify individuals with uh, a family history that were at increased risk, uh, assess the patient's risk, and it had a, it had a tool that included all of the uh, of the family history uh, tools that you've heard about so far, and many more, uh, which provided information about whether they were online, whether they were on paper, whether they were free, whether they, they, are, they had a patient portal, uh, to allow a practice to try to pick a system, a family history collection system, that was suitable for their practice, uh, to communicate that risk uh, to the patient and ultimately manage the patient and have connections to genetic counseling as appropriate and how to do that. So this toolkit had lots of specific tools. Each of these four steps were sort of stepwise going with examples. Uh, and we thought this was uh, like the cat's meow. You know, this is going to be used uh, uh, immediately. Uh, and um, and so we had an implementation plan uh, for this. This was launched. Uh, it was presented here uh, a year ago at, uh, at this meeting uh, in May and then launched officially in June. Uh, and there are multiple options. You can download the options of the full guide or a quick start guide or individual sections. Uh, you, there are digital and, and print ready versions. Uh, and um, the we used a webinar uh, shortly after it was launched to introduce this to uh, the, the roundtable and our, uh, our, our folks, the folks that follow us. 
The dissemination and promotion was done really in parallel uh, by the Roundtable and the Jackson Laboratories. Uh, and at the round table, it was uh, put on the resource center, it was sent out on our newsletters, it was uh, put on social media channels, uh, and uh, sent to select partners to try to get them enthused about pro using it and promoting it and giving us feedback. Uh, and the Amer through the American Cancer Society staff, hospital system staff, uh, uh, presented to individual uh, hospitals and their primary care groups. Jackson Laboratory posted on their lab and their social media tools. They had a big email campaign campaign, uh, and then they blogged about it during National Family Hi Health History Month. So a lot was done to sort of make people aware of this um, post. Uh, in addition, um, uh, mostly Emily uh, Edelman uh, from Jackson Laboratories and some of us uh, presented workshops either independently or together uh, to present this to other organizations, either local or national organizations, and we did get some feedback. Uh, so the feedback that we got that we thought was important is uh, people thought it seemed daunting. It was big. Uh, the total guide, toolkit was 77 pages. The quick start guide was 18 pages. Uh, and even the quick start guide seemed uh, big. So uh, that's, an, that's a recommendation that we're dealing with. And the second is, uh, was that it's too colorectal cancer focused. A primary care doc uh, wants to deal with cancer, not colorectal cancer. Uh, and so uh, it led to, the, led to the idea that many of these same issues are cross-cutting uh, and that perhaps we should develop a shorter <laughs> cancer toolkit that would incorporate the essence of this, um, uh, of this work. We do know a little bit about the use. We have some use metrics, uh, the number of downloads from the National Colorectal Cancer uh, websites, the number of page views uh, uh, of either the main page or any page, the average time on the page, either at, in, at the round table or Jackson Lab. And I don't know what these mean, actually. I don't, I don't know if that's good or bad. Uh, but Caleb uh, told me <laughs> that that's the third most popular resource on the, on the NCCRT resource guide, so I guess that's, oh, that's good. Um, and then recently, uh, Caleb launched an opt-in uh, option to, con to allow us to contact folks who've downloaded the kit to try to get direct feedback from those folks to try to learn more about the use and, and not use of this toolkit. Um, uh, implementation validated, validation, we've had a real champion, Javier Lora, who's here, uh, uh, was really an early user. He submitted an NCI grant application very early, uh, maybe even before the official launch of this, to use this toolkit and validate it in his clinics. Uh, and that was submitted to the NCI. It wasn't funded. The criticism was that it needed an implementation scientist, and I, I think this is an important need. Uh, and the NIH then funded the Yale Center for Implementation Science under Steve Bernstein. Uh, and so Javier has, has uh, resubmitted uh, this proposal at a, as a P50 grant. He did receive funding for implementation of the toolkit in the clinic, pending funding for the validation research. So uh, this is the kind of help uh, we're looking for. It's not enough help. Uh, we need your help. So any of your groups that would like to improve family history collection, uh, early, early detection of colorectal cancer in your practices, we would love to work with you and uh, see if the, if the toolkit is helpful for you and which ways it is and which ways we can make it better. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is the, uh, uh, the Delphi survey that we did, getting back to uh, what are the important elements, the specific important elements that are necessary in any high-quality uh, electronic health record. This arose from a survey that the Roundtable did a number of years ago, concluding that all EHRs essentially had a family history section. They all included cancer family history, but there was highly variable content of what was in it, uh, and none of them were, that were studied in this, uh, mostly in uh, federally qualified health centers, had any links to decision making. Uh, and we thought that we needed agreement on the optimal content of uh, the family history section uh, before we could go and try to help with vendors to get this information collected. Uh, so that we used a modified Delphi survey. I worked with Jan Lauer and Heather Hample in developing these questions. We vetted them within the round table and the family history group. Uh, and our initial plan was to survey a large group of providers, uh, uh, several hundred, 
providers. But we had a great deal of difficulty getting primary care providers to uh, be, to get to them actually, and, and get responses. So we modified the questions on the basis of what we learned here. Uh, and then we recruited uh, a number of experts and decided to do an expert uh, Delphi survey, 12 primary care docs, 12 genetic counselors, 12 gastroenterologists. This is an iterative process. Uh, the questions were developed and vetted and then sent out and the responses to those were reviewed uh, with the participants, uh, revised to try to make it more likely to come to consensus. We define consensus as having over 80% agreement uh, that of the participants either agree or strongly agree with that particular issue. Here's an example uh, in, the, in one realm here is about the goals. What are the goals of, of the family history section? Uh, and um, let's take this one, a short one. Uh, so uh, should a goal of, a fam of every family history be able to identify patients who should be referred to a genetic counselor? Uh, and the, the people had this, these options to choose. Uh, and then ultimately, and there were a series of questions like this, uh, ultimately these uh, answers were uh, plotted out like this. And so the blue is strongly agree, the red is agree, uh, the green is neither agree nor disagree, uh, the purple is disagree, and the light blue is strongly disagree. So that 80% of so this is 80%. Uh, so if the, group, if the red or blue got across this, that was cons defined by, as consensus uh, a priori. Uh, so you can see that in this set of goals, all of these goals reached consensus. There was consensus that these should be important parts. Uh, the, uh, the EHR should be able to do these, reach these goals. And I'll, I'll just uh, show you some of the interesting results. There's a... Um, uh, we had a high retention of participants. There were 10 questions, 76 items. The census, there was consensus on 36. Uh, the, um, uh, in, the, in the goals area, there was high consent. 100% of all three of those groups uh, either agreed or strongly agreed uh, that you should identify patients, that the EHR should be able to identify patients who should be referred for genetic counseling or those who meet clinical guidelines for more intense screening than average risk individuals. Not surprising. Uh, there, there, there are some surprises, however. Everybody agreed that for all first degree relatives should be included in the family history. Uh, there was a consensus barely among all the groups that second degree relatives should be included. But look at this, primary care providers, only 69% of primary care providers thought that second degree relatives should be included, can, the cancer and second degree relatives in the EHR. Uh, and um, there was also consensus that the age uh, at cancer diagnosis should be included, but in our original survey, many of the AHRs didn't include age as a, as a, a retrievable uh, field. Uh, in the area of uh, the EHR should have the capacity to alert providers that there's potentially elevated cancer risk, strong agreement, and also about require, alerting providers if they require different screening. Uh, but look at this. This is an uh, uh, issue about whether general practice alert should be uh, developed. Uh, and there was general consensus, but again, the primary care providers were leery of this, uh, uh, these practice alerts. Uh, the, uh, or the issue about whether uh, the EHR, the family history, should be updated. Everybody agreed that when new uh, information was available, it should be updated. Uh, but, and everyone, no one agreed that it shouldn't have routine updates, but there was no consensus about whether that should be every one year, every three years, or every five years. Um, uh, finally, um, this whole issue of the incentivization to complete the family history uh, portion of the uh, EHR. Uh, everyone believed, or almost everyone believed, that it's expected part of high quality uh, care and that it's a shared responsibility uh, with patients. However, uh, should, as to the issue of whether it should be followed as a quality metric, genetic counselors and gastroenterologists felt pretty strongly it should be. Uh, and primary care providers thought pretty strongly it shouldn't be. Uh, we think this is likely because these quality metrics, uh, the primary care docs have lots and lots of quality metrics. They're resistant to adding more, I think. That's Reasonable, um, and then similarly here, uh, that whether, this sh whether in fact family history collection should be part of the common uh, clinical data set and meaningful use. Uh, again, the primary care providers were not keen on this, the genetic counselors were, and the gastroenterologists weren't either. Again, probably because of this whole issue of burden uh, to do, uh, to have another metric to be followed. 
So overall, the family history task and early onset task group is strong. Uh, they have a lot of expertise, a lot of energy. It's really an enthusiastic group. It's very collaborative, and as a result of these things, it's been very product productive. And I think it's uh, clearly in good hands uh, going forward. Um, it's been great fun for me to be part of this group, uh, and I, have, I really am grateful to them and thank them for that, and I thank you for your attention.